Welcome to Web Handling. My name is Dave Royce and I am super excited to continue our new mini-series on measurements. In this very short show, we discuss a very important topic. That is how to improve the resolution of your measurements so that your trials are faster and your conclusions are surer. We also share a fun story. This is a continuation of Web 201.71a through d, so it might be best to see them first if you've not already done so. I know your time is precious, so let's get started. Recall from the last clip where we listed three types of measurement categories. The least useful was the fishing expedition where one measures anything and everything that is convenient in the hopes that a correlation of some sort is found. The statistical sin here may be p-hacking, which we will cover in the next clip. Next is the target measurement, where one has some working theory, hopefully solidly based on science or at least experience. It could state, for example, that it is believed that O is a function of X, Y, and Z, all of which we will measure in our trials. In any case, the waste, delay, or customer complaint objective function is likely one of the most important measurements you are likely to make. It is also one that you should give the most thought and time to. Improving the resolution of the objective or any measurement is the subject of this clip. There are three important criteria by which we will judge the goodness of our objective function or any other measurement. First, since we are presumably in the business of making money, the measure must be closely related to economics. Waste, delay, customer complaints are quite common concerns here. Second, the measure should be narrowly defined, quite narrowly defined for the purpose of a effective troubleshooting. For example, the total accumulated length of MD wrinkles coming out of our coder is far better than rolls rejected at the customer due to wrinkles. Note the specificity of this measurement. Total length of defective material. This specificity avoids mixing good material and bad material in a defect bin called shipping rolls. Note the specificity of position immediately after the coder. This specificity avoids mixing wrinkles from different source locations on our machine and perhaps narrows the remedy options to coding and coding machine. Finally, note the specificity of the defect itself. One wrinkle type, the MD wrinkle of perhaps 20 different kinds that might be seen on a line. This specificity avoids mixing unrelated wrinkles into our objective measure. Note that how to diagnose and name wrinkle types has been well covered in several clips on this All Web Handling channel. In short, these specificities avoid diluting the goodness of our objective measure. Lastly, our objective measure should be simultaneously good, fast, and cheap. Obviously, this is a tall order to satisfy, but it is worthwhile to do the best you can here. Here, for example, it might be worthwhile to make the extra effort to temporarily hand classify all wrinkles and measure their length on a short trial than to let wrinkle illiterate QA tech pass judgment on acceptability. Is it good or is it bad? As is the common practice. A good measure is desirably accurate, meaning it can be checked against an independent and hopefully different type of measurement that is hopefully more trustworthy. 
Yes, it is possible to do great trial work with measurements for which accuracy has no meaning whatsoever. In winders, for example, roll hardness instruments cannot be checked against an independent standard because there is none. Yet these tools are still quite useful. A good measurement is desirably repeatable, sensitive, linear, and non-hysteretic, all of which are easily quantifiable by checking the instrument as we cover in this Web 201.71 series. Beyond these requirements, we want our measurement to have the best resolution we can afford, which is the focus of the next couple of slides. Ranked in order of best to worst, analog is better than grading, is better than binary, that is better than the subjective measures. So, why are analog measurements so, so much, much better than binary measurements? Simple. Analog measurements can have orders of magnitude better resolution. That means you could do fewer trials, fewer measurements, and or get statistically better conclusions. So let's give a few examples to illustrate how many binary measurements can quite easily be turned into the far superior analog measurements, often with only a little more effort. In all cases, we will improve on the traditional go, no go, pass, fail metrics that has a resolution of only two. The first example is measuring the length, or better yet, area of miscoding in a roll versus noting where a roll has miscoding or not miscoding. This can be done automatically on some optical defect detection systems, but can usually be done manually with a tape measure, stopwatch, rewinder, or other readily available tools. Note how useful this analog measure is. For example, a decrease in coding viscosity might reduce troubles from 145 square centimeters per roll to 15 square centimeters per roll of miscoding. A huge improvement, even if the roll had some miscoding. You would likely lose all of this information with traditional roll-based rejection measures. Does it have a coding mist or not? Even if the viscosity or other test factor by itself is not strong enough to kill the problem, it will decrease complaints and make it that much easier for a second parameter in conjunction with the first to reduce complaints to economically acceptable values. The bottom line with all of these examples and more is we don't want to paralyze our continuous efforts with home run thinking and traditional pass-fail metrics. Continuing on with more examples, we could measure the length of wrinkles as a huge improvement on merely noting whether a roll has a wrinkle or not. As another example, we could count wound roll defects, such as crepe wrinkles, as a huge improvement on merely noting whether a roll has a crepe or not crepe. Two crepes is far better than 20, and we will take it. Finally, we can count the number of minutes of downtime due to some specific cause, such as mechanical, instead of noting whether the machine went down at all during the shift due to a mechanical breakdown. In all of these examples, nothing special is usually required to improve our trial results beyond readily available stopwatches, rulers, and rewinders. Not a single extra minute of trial time is required. Just a bit more time in post-process measurements.
I hope you now see the overwhelming advantages of making the effort to get a good objective function and measurement, even if you have to creatively invent one from scratch solely for the purpose of this one study. Yet, I also acknowledge there are many obstacles to doing this. Time and money are two obvious obstacles that we all deal with every day. Management and tradition are two more obvious obstacles. Let me share a fun story to illustrate the latter. I once worked for a Fortune 500 company who had a truly world-class statistical department. This department supported process engineers and troubleshooters and their labs. One of the old and surprisingly wise of the PhDs working there told me that if our company had invented the blood pressure machine, they would have averaged the systolic and diastolic measurements together so that they only had to report one number to management. So what happens when you average the two blood pressure types together? Well, you lose almost all useful information. The same is true of total cholesterol. The same is true of counting the number of rolls in a month that customers return. The same is true of many of our traditional measures of waste, delay, and customer complaint. There are three starting points for more detailed discussion of problem solving using measurements. The first is my industrial problem solving book that is a good companion to my industrial problem solving course of the same name. The second is the must have 750 page web handling handbook written by myself, Tim Walker and Dylan Jones. This is where we would look for the most useful measurements for most web and most role defects. These applied properties that are science-based can help you avoid going on unnecessary and fruitless fishing expeditions. Last but not least is my award-winning and trademarked Web 101 class that has been taken by 5,000 people just like you. Here, you will learn about web handling, winding, common converting operations like slitting, as well as a good sprinkling of problem-solving techniques. Thank you so very much for joining me in this Measurement Miasma mini-series. Stay tuned for the next clip where we will explain the quite common statistical sin called p-hacking that is often the end result of data mining. If you would have a topic you would like to hear about, let me know in the comment section below. If you found anything interesting or useful here, please like and share and subscribe. See you next time.